Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Pam calls me a long time Alaskan, and she's actually fibbing. Although I have a long time love of Alaska. Is it working? I might need help with this. Can you still hear me now? Okay. I have a long time love of Alaska, but my knowledge is not nearly as deep as the wisdom you heard in the first panel. That was awesome, wasn't it? It was just fabulous, and I'm actually humbled to be here because I have a tiny bit of wisdom to impart compared to what we heard this morning. I do have a love of Alaska, though. I came here as a very young medical student in 1980 to work in the old hospital in YKHC. Anybody of you remember the hospital they had before the yellow submarine? So I learned my first baby steps in medicine and in pediatrics in the pre-yellow submarine hospital. And uh, then when I was in my training, I would come back every winter because many of you probably remember uh, Ron Brennan. So Ron was my mentor out in Bethel. And he, of course, runs dogs. And so every January, he'd say, Ruth, you got to come up for January. I can't do pediatrics. i got to run dogs. And so I would come up just for the month of January, work in the YKHC, and Ron would prepare for his next Iditarod. So I hear that Ron just retired last month. And to me, it's a big loss for Alaska Native children because he did such a great work out in YK and, and when he moved to Anchorage as well. Um, in taking care of kids with all kinds of different uh, illnesses and disabilities. And uh, so that's when my love of Alaska started. And then I actually came back to Alaska full time to work at South Central Foundation back in the year 2001. And for about uh, seven and a half years, I was the research director for South Central Foundation. And um, that was wonderful fun. And actually, um, I maintain a lot of good friends there as well. But now I work at the Environmental Protection Agency in Washington, D.C., and I only get to make short trips to Alaska. But it is a joy to be here, and thank you for the invitation. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what the Environmental Protection Agency is doing to protect children. Children here, children in many other parts of the country, because we believe children are the most vulnerable to environmental contamination and need special protection. And what I'd like to talk about is just a little bit about their differences. I think most people in this audience probably appreciate that, but I wanted to be sure we cover it in case you don't, which is that children have quite different environmental exposures than adults do. They are physiologically different from adults, and they have certain windows of vulnerability when their brains and when their lungs are developing when an environmental insult can have a particularly nasty effect. And uh, they're different in a number of ways. Proportionately to an adult body size, they breathe more air, they consume more food and water pound per pound than adults do. Um, they spend more time outside, sometimes exposed to different things because they're at ground level. And they're, of course, ingesting dust and dirt and feral Cheerios from all over the place. And so they have a lot of things that get into their mouths that don't get into the mouths of adults. And just recently, we've begun to recognize that the environmental hazards that affect children compound the other hazards that they are already facing, the hazards of poverty and malnutrition and stressful circumstances. And so we need to look holistically at all the bad things that may be happening and try to make a more healthful environment for children to live and to thrive in. Um, the EPA has a number of things that we've done in Alaska in conjunction with many other partners, including partners in the Rural Alaska Children's Environmental Health Initiative, working to create specific tools that will help, uh, for example, tools for school environmental health assessments. We've worked on training and outreach on children's environmental health. We've got partners at ANTHC who work with us, especially on issues related to air pollution, and we'd like to do more. Um, we lead the Rural Alaska Dust Work Group, and there are some funding opportunities that come available to communities through that Dust Work Group to get funds for issues of importance to children's environmental health. And we continue to emphasize that there's a lot more to be done in Alaska, as everyone in this room knows. We need to do more on water and sanitation because of the links between respiratory and skin infections that are associated with lack of in-home water service. We know that indoor air quality remains a pressing concern throughout Alaska. 
Um, we want to work together with communities to really focus on mold as one of the issues that can have a really detrimental effect on children's environmental health. And in the outdoor air, we continue to work on issues related to smoke and to vehicle exhaust, um, as well as solid waste and open dumps um, that can be places for children to um, become diseased. But I want to talk more about things that need more attention. And what we believe needs more attention nationwide is the fact that we're having an epidemic of chronic diseases among children in this country. Um, we know that rates of developmental diseases among children are increasing across the country. We know that many children are affected by asthma. And we see rising rates of obesity as well. And there's every indication that a mixture of factors, including industrialization and urbanization and poverty and inequity, as well as things like climate change and deforestation, are all contributing to this epidemic of chronic diseases that we're seeing in children. And they're more vulnerable, and they're suffering, and they're the future. And so we, together with ACAD and all the partners in this room, are eager to find ways to take action to stem this epidemic of chronic disease among children. Now, I come from the medical field. I'm a pediatrician. And, and so when we talk about this, most pediatricians will say, well, we're doing so much better with childhood cancer. And in fact, it is correct. The five-year survival for children shown here on this slide by year of diagnosis, has dramatically increased. And so children who get cancer actually often survive. The, the rates can be higher than 80% survival. But what I'm worried about is that we see a steady, slow increase in the incidence of childhood cancer in this country. Here you can see data from 1973 through the re most recent data that NIH provides for 2012. And you can see that this is an upward slope of all cancers among all children from 0 to 19 years of age. We would like to find a way of stemming this upward increase in childhood cancer. And there's some evidence that toxic chemicals in the environment can contribute to the chronic disease epidemic that we're seeing in this country. And we know that there's growing evidence that there are environmental links to childhood cancer. For example, the links with radiation are very clear cut. The links with solvent exposure, especially exposure to benzene, are well understood. We know that parents' employment in certain industries, such as industries that use solvents, like painting and printing, can be a risk factor for the development of childhood cancers. And we know that some pesticide exposures, especially prenatally, can be a risk factor for the development of childhood cancer. So before I came to EPA, I worked at the World Health Organization. And one of the big issues facing us at the World Health Organization is trying to make estimates of how much disease could be prevented if we actually could modify our environment. And so I'd like to share with you some of the data, not so much from the United States as much as worldwide estimates that the World Health Organization made to try to answer the question of, if we could get rid of air pollution, water pollution, food pollution, how much good would it do our health? And let me tell you how they went about this work. The first thing that they did was they had a very constrained definition of environmental health. Included in this definition, were uh, of environment, I should say. And under the World Health Organization definition of environment, we see things like air, water, and soil pollution, radiation, noise, occupational risks, the built environment, climate change, and hand washing. But on the right-hand side, you see many things that some of us do consider environment, which WHO decided to exclude from their analysis. Things like exposures to alcohol and tobacco and drugs, things like diet and bed nets and unemployment and natural hazards and person-to-person -person transmission of any disease. So we consider this to be a rather conservative estimate of environment. And here are the results. WHO divides the world into many different regions. And for the purposes of this graph, just know that these are the WHO regions. But the thing to look at is the world average, which is 24%. What this means is that if we could clean up our air, our water, our soil, our food pollution, 
WHO tells us that about 24% of diseases would go away. Now, wouldn't that be fabulous? And shouldn't that be what we are aiming for? Excuse me. Um, well, EPA believes that in order to work on these issues and in order to make better links between health and environment, we actually need to make better connections among people about how environment is affecting our health. Because many people don't really fully understand that environment is one of the determinants of health. And so EPA, in conjunctions with our partners at the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, funds pediatric environmental health specialty units. And there's a pediatric environmental health specialty unit in Seattle that serves the Alaska area. And I know you guys have interacted with them. They're a powerful force for good in pediatric environmental health. We also have them in nine other units. And they work together as a network to bring information to clinicians and others who often don't have a lot of background in how to deal with children who are having problems because of the environment in which they're living. And WHO is always also playing an important role in this because they realize that training of doctors and nurses is so important. And they've developed extensive training packages that are peer-reviewed PowerPoint modules in order to help doctors and nurses with all the questions that they get from parents. Because often parents come in with really good questions and the physician has no idea how to answer them. The work that EPA and WHO are doing is to try to better prepare clinicians for the questions that parents and communities have. So what are parents worried about? Here's a whole variety of things that parents in the lower 48 told surveyors that they were interested about. And about midway through, you can see environmental pollution. 47% of parents in this survey of about 1,000 parents said that they were worried about environmental pollution. And yet, we don't prepare the doctors to answer their questions. So most of the reason is that doctors are actually pretty hesitant about this field. Um, they're, they're kind of shy about asking the patients in their practice about the environment for fear that they may not know the answer to the question. And this cartoon shows what may happen. They're afraid they might open up a Pandora's box, that the floodgates might come open, and their medical school training hasn't adequately prepared them to know what the next steps ought to be when dealing with environmental health problems in childhood. So it's not only that they're unaware about environmental factors, but they often don't take an environmental history to know what children are exposed to. Um, they may not know how to effectively ask or answer parents' questions, and they may not even know how to diagnose or treat environmental illnesses. And so they often feel like they have minimal control over environmental hazards, and that's often why they don't bring it up with patients in their practice. But we believe that asking is so important. And the reason it's important is asking is the first step to digging in to what is affecting the child's health and to digging in how that might be preventable. And so let's say a patient comes in with a common disease like asthma. There's a whole array of things that the doctor should be asking about and the parent should be discussing with every child who has asthma, ranging from secondhand smoke indoors to moldy in home environments um, to pollens and, mold and ozone and particulate matter. And this should be part of the conversation around every child with asthma so that prevention can be put into place. But clinicians should also consider environmental etiologies even when the disease is not asthma. They should consider environmental etiologies for persistent middle ear effusions, for abdominal pain and constipation, which could be lead poisoning, for headaches, which could be due to carbon monoxide or formaldehyde exposure, for developmental delays, which could well be linked to exposure to lead or other heavy metals, to seizures, skin rashes, and anemia, and the list goes on and on. We believe it's important to dialogue between parents and physicians when children come in with illnesses that could be caused by contamination of the environment. And there are a couple triggers that physicians typically think of. Uh, 
they get clinical suspicion when they see certain illnesses like asthma that there could be environmental exacerbants and they often ask. But they should also listen to parents' concerns because parents often know best what their child is exposed to and it's the duty of the physician to take that parent concern seriously and dig into it with an environmental history. It's most important to ask about certain exposures when the baby is certain is at certain ages. So for example, in the prenatal visit, the parent and physician should talk about the home environment and carbon monoxide, renovations of the home, mold. In the preschool years, to talk about where the ch children are playing and arts and crafts exposures. And you can see that certain things are more common in summer and winter. This should be part of the conversation between parents and doctors in order to keep kids healthy. So what should clinicians be asking? Well, we have a book that the uh, prepared with funding from the Environmental Protection Agency that's called Pediatric Environmental Health. And in that book, your doctor will find a whole series of questions that should be part of routine medical care. Questions about things like secondhand smoke in the home, questions about where the water source for the family is, exposures that they may have from food, and exposures that they may get from parents' occupations or hobbies. So in summary, we believe that children are more vulnerable than adults to environmental toxicants and that one important tool that physicians and parents can use is a pediatric environmental health history to start that dialogue between parent and clinician about the various environmental exposures of concern because this can be the best platform for providing prevention advice. So EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy is dedicated to having people understand that EPA is actually a public health agency as well. Our duty is not only to protect the environment, but to protect public health. And you'll see during the rest of her term as administrator, she will have an increasing emphasis on helping the public and doctors to understand the inextricable link between health and our environment. Thank you very much.